much once again for joining us today for another webinar from the specific learning disorders series. This is the third webinar from the series, like most of you must know. Today, we'll be talking about planning instructions for children with specific learning disorders with Geeta Gopiji. More about her a little later. Let me tell you a little bit more about Ability. So for us as an organization, all carers of children with special needs, be it parents, special educators, therapists, all of you are at the center of our universe because we believe that every child wants to thrive and every child should be given the opportunity to thrive. And the way we try to achieve this is by making things easier for you all. Our mission, in fact, is to make things easier for we, you all. One way we have been able to do it is through technology, but we definitely understand that while technology could help a lot, technology without the caregivers is insufficient. Technology alone could not bring about a significant change. It can only be a support system, like there are other support systems required, such as community, resources, because no one should have to do this alone, right? And that's why Ability brings to you community and other resources to enable the best chance of discovering your child's true potential. One way we bring to you these resources is through our YouTube channel, which has more than hundreds of useful videos from various experts of the community, which can help you learn better and help your child better. So if you haven't visited our YouTube channel yet, go to youtube.com, search for EBLITY and subscribe to our channel so that you can stay posted about all our future updates. What you can also do is follow our Facebook page. Thousands of people are already doing it. You can join the list and stay updated about all the upcoming events that Ability would be organizing online or offline and all the new announcements that we are going to make to help uh, to reach out to you all and spread the awareness further and wide. This webinar is an effort in the direction of our mission. Like I already said, the mission of making things easier for you all. We have been conducting webinars in the past and we'll continue to do so in the future. Another recent addition to our list of things that we bring to you is the workshops. The way workshops are a little different is it will happen in a small group setting, which will enable more direct interaction with the expert and more direct learning directly from the expert. So if you haven't experienced any of the ability workshops yet, this is the time to subscribe to one of them. And like I already said, this is the third webinar from the series. We have already talked about introduction to specific learning disorders and identification and diagnosis of specific learning disorders in the past two webinars. Today, we'll be talking about planning instructions. After that, next Thursday, these webinars happen every Thursday at 4.30 p.m. If you haven't yet uh, registered for the entire series, the link to register for the entire series is going uh, in the chat box. You can register for the entire series. You just need to click yes, register for the entire series. The upcoming webinars in the series would be covering support systems for children with SLD and then some different types of SLD such as dyslexia, dysgraphia and dyscalculia. The experts would be talking about all these topics in much greater detail in the upcoming webinars. And without further ado, coming to our speaker for the day, Madam Geeta Gopi, she is a rehabilitation practitioner and psychologist, a, the Director of Professional Development Programs at the Sashakti Karan Trust Cochin over, with over 30 years of experience in helping children with special needs. She has worked in international schools following American curriculum for inclusive settings primarily for more than 15 years and also done some intensive work in curriculum development and adaptations, behavioral management, coordinating and promoting best educational practices using UDL principles among staff and parents. Also, she has launched an early academic series, which is a teacher's kit for teaching 
early English language skills and basic mathematics based on the universal design of learning again. Thank you so much, Geeta Ji, for joining us. We are so, so excited and glad to have you here with us today. Uh, I hope I'm visible, audible, everything. <laughs> yes, yes, you're very clearly visible and audible. Thank you so much for joining us. A very good evening to all the participants and uh, a warm welcome. You know, I'm very comfortable with the Ability platform and all the uh, Ability, um, you know, uh, coordinators and organizers. So thank you for this opportunity and great to be here again with your wonderful uh, community of participants. So without further ado, I'll uh, go into the webinar straight away. Sure. I'll share. I'll just do a quick recap from the last webinar, which was on um, identification and diagnosis. Uh, we talked about, uh, I think it was Toby Philip Jacob who was uh, doing this webinar from the Sashek Sikaran Test uh, Coaching. He talked about the identification and diagnosis of SLD, the different kinds of assessments and the purpose of assessments for what each assessment is done that defines uh, what uh, the purpose of that assessment would define what kind of assessments would be done. Uh, and uh, finally, when you get the assessment uh, done, uh, use that information for uh, you know different kinds of purposes. So that was discussed. Various tools that would be used for different kinds of assessments such as screening, informal assessment, formal diagnostic assessment, et cetera, were also discussed. So moving from this, we go into today's focus, which is, uh, you know, we have to start, once we finish the assessment, we go into planning and instruction program. So today our focus would be on understanding before we go into the planning of instruction, we need to understand the learning process, uh, a holistic learning or a wholesome learning approach how to plan for instruction, what to take care of while planning, using the VEAKT approach for holistic learning and instruction focus. Uh, what should the instruction focus be when we plan uh, instruction in different kinds of settings? So a basic outline of what the learning process would look like. Uh, learning is far more complex than what it is here. But at least this is a base. This gives us a basic understanding of what is learning, how it takes place. So the first step is usually the sensory input that we get from all our five senses, which is uh, through through seeing, through hearing, through touch, through uh, taste, and through smell. So all the five sense organs, all the sensory stimuli from all the five sense organs, actually gives us a lot of sensory input, which then goes to the brain. And uh, it is in the brain that this uh, information is processed and uh, meaning is derived out of it. That is, we try and make sense out of what we have experienced through our uh, sense, uh, sensations. And then uh, once uh, when we uh, derive meaning and we make sense of this, and when this happens repeatedly, it is stored in the brain, which we call popularly as memory. So the third stage is information storage and usually information storage takes place in the form of language the form of uh, words symbols pictures um, you know sounds etc so uh, Hi, again, this is, sorry yes, to interrupt yes. you yeah uh, some of the participants are saying that they're not able to hear you very clearly could you try and be a little loud and maybe bring the mic near your mouth okay, so that yeah, yeah. Okay, 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 so that's fine should I start from the beginning again? No, no, I think this would find maybe. Oh, okay, yeah. So uh, most of the information that is stored, it's stored as uh, language and symbols. And then ultimately, when these things are repeated several times, a lot of impressions are made in the brain. Finally, we make sense of a uh, concept or, uh, you know, we understand what a concept is. So concept formation takes place. And this is a basic understanding of how learning process is how all of us learn, not just children with SLD. 
but in children with sld some uh, they have difficulties in learning because many of these uh, in some of these uh, stages they may have snags or glitches or certain things may not be happening smoothly or certain kinds of processing may be affected so therefore the learning process the concept formation and uh, memory and such things also get affected so uh, we uh, this helps us to understand how learning takes place so if there are glitches in those learning how can we go about planning our instruction in such a way that we try and uh, circumvent these kind of difficulties so in a holistic learning approach what are the things we have to keep in mind uh, the first thing is learning goals and objectives should be based on the child's current or present level of functioning so when we do an assessment we get a certain amount of information based on uh, you know what the child does especially if you are doing an uh, an educational assessment or, or even an informal assessment which is for planning instruction we look at the child's academic skills the others um, also the other skill sets and behaviors which are necessary for acquiring academics such as attention such as being able to sit at a table and do paper pencil task or a pencil grips etc so these kinds of current uh, skill sets as well as academic levels have to be assessed and based on that current level of functioning from there on you plan the learning goals and objectives uh, for instruction when we plan instruction we have to also keep in mind that different children learn differently each child has their own strengths and they may have their own Uh, challenges they may uh, be uh, some may be very strong visual learners some may be very strong uh, auditory learners some children may learn more through movement uh, or through touch so it depends on each uh, child uh, what learning modality is stronger in them so use the child's strengths to help facilitate better and more efficient learning the third point is uh, working on the academic areas uh, and uh, not only the academic areas or the academic content uh, that we uh, fo- uh, that we need to focus on but we also have to focus on the skills and behaviors that are posing challenges or becoming hurdles in that learning process Uh, for example as i said attention or you know being able to hold a pencil being able to read so any any uh, when we are teaching these academic uh, areas we shouldn't just be looking at the syllabus or the curriculum content but we should also be take into account the skills and behaviors that uh, would enable better academic acquisition you have to also think about using uh, while we do this okay when we uh, teach plan instruction also think about using appropriate teaching or learning materials so how to enable the child to learn will also inform you about looking around for teaching and learning materials that are more suitable for that child's learning process or learning modality so use appropriate teaching or learning uh, materials and this would also include the use of technology use necessary accommodations and modifications so every child would need some kind of accommodations or modifications while you're teaching and these come in many forms it could be in the area of the language that you use for teaching it could be in a you know how to uh, in the behavioral area or the classroom environment the way the seating is done in the classroom it could also be you know what are the uh support systems you are going to provide uh for uh, the child maybe visual supports or auditory supports etc so accommodations and modifications come in many forms uh, uh, and uh, shapes so use necessary accommodations and modifications uh incorporating input from transdisciplinary professionals as and when needed in sld many of the children do have uh, you know difficulties with their fine motor skills or their sensory integration issues uh, they may be very clumsy or uh, you know have such motor coordination issues may also have some speech and language issues vocabulary issues or uh, pronunciation problems etc so may you may need as an educator to take input from a professional such as a speech therapist or an occupational therapist a psychologist or a behavior therapist etc so whichever other professionals are in, involved 
take their uh, you know input also and try and incorporate those also into your learning activities while planning for your instructional activities giving due importance to healthy social and emotional growth so last but not the least you have to give enough importance for healthy social and emotional growth a lot of the children with sld do experience you know uh, low self esteem feeling of worthlessness or you know they give up very easily without trying uh, because of the struggle involved in their learning process so you need to uh, as educators you know provide those kind of supports that will foster good uh, emotional growth give them the kind of support that is necessary uh, make them feel good about themselves celebrate their small successes when they uh, come across hurdles you know uh, give uh, give assurances or give uh, strategies to show how they can they can cope with those struggles and difficulties so all these leads to better social and emotional growth this also leads to you know uh, you know uh, them interacting with their peers in a more positive manner using the peer buddy its system like you know using the peer group to help them in areas where they may need support so all these uh, are little strategies which help in uh, healthy social and emotional growth so that also has to be included when you plan their uh, uh, learning uh, environment and their learning goals while you are planning instruction some of the most important things that you need to uh, uh, take care of is uh, always when you are teaching your uh, your learning objectives or your learning goals should proceed from the known to the unknown simple to complex concrete to abstract these are the basis of any education especially special education known to unknown is for example if you are uh, trying to teach uh, alpha uh, three letter words uh, phonetically you know the known component would be okay the child knows all the alphabet sounds so review that and from that point go, do a springboard into you know uh, dive into the three uh, three letter word so from the known level you're moving to the unknown level so uh, starting from the known level always gives them a comfortable hook to uh, you know a comfortable platform to launch into the unknown and that gives them greater confidence so whatever lessons you're planning start from the known same way go from the simple to complex uh, with uh, most of the curricula and sometimes even our regular uh, regular education textbooks do not necessarily proceed in uh, proper uh, sequential steps so it is very important to start from the simplest step and go in very small sequential steps moving higher up the skill order uh, so uh, moving from very simple uh, concepts and then slowly introducing the more uh, complex ones concrete to abstract concrete to abstract is you start with manipulative hands on things which the children can actually manipulate and you know actually have control over and then you move on to more abstract things like mental uh, you know mentally visualizing the things and so on especially in math for example you know when you start with concrete you start with materials like you know using counters for counting and and then slowly you move on to mental math so move from concrete to abstract so it's very important while planning instruction to move in small sequential steps uh, use a variety of learning activities that provides repetition uh, in different ways and preferably use high interest activities so if the child is really interested in art and craft try and use more of those activities uh, to uh, get your concept across Uh, if the child is interested in movement and games you know use a lot of games and such things to uh, uh, to for to uh, in your learning activities to uh, f- facilitate better learning so use a variety of learning activities it doesn't mean that you only use high interest ones but um, when you use the high interest ones that gets the child more motivated and slowly you can introduce all the other activities as well including paper pencil activities model and rehearse how the information is being processed that is think aloud this is something which is very very important for children with sld because uh, many of them have trouble with processing the information so if you are uh, doing a say a maths problem you know if you have the steps in solving the maths problem 
as an educator say it aloud say the steps aloud and encourage the child also to verbalize these steps aloud and then do the maths problem and this can be done across it doesn't matter whether it's maths or language or anything any activity any exercise they are doing especially paper pencil activities which are not which are very abstract and 2d uh, you know model and rehearse uh, or think aloud the procedure so that gives the uh, children uh, an idea about how we go about processing that information and doing that exercise use diagrams graphic uh, graphics or graphic organizers and pictures such as flow charts tables etc to impart uh, information and this is particularly true when curriculum content increases a lot uh, subject content matter comes in especially in higher classes um, where a lot of information is there in the lessons and you need to condense it uh, into relevant points so using these kind of uh, uh, visuals uh, graphic organizers diagrams flow charts and uh, maps etc actually help the children to understand and retain that information better teach self monitoring skills self monitoring skills is something which is very um, uh, quite often not present or very minimally present in many children with uh, sld and uh, what this involves is you know to be aware of one's own self so for example if when we read when we read a sentence uh, if we misread a word after reading immediately we realize it you know that something was not right so we go back and reread that word again which automatically happens with most of us but with children with sld this doesn't happen automatically so they are unable to self monitor what they are doing so definitely we need to uh, make them aware of you know where they they are prone to making more errors point them out give them coping strategies to uh, you know to circumvent or go around that one example of this is for example uh, when children reverse letters b and d this is very common and uh, usually when they are reading or writing words which have b and d they tend to reverse so one of the self monitoring skills you know uh, what i would say is you know use a look at the poster on the classroom wall so before if you think it's a b word or a d word before you even write it down please look at the poster get your uh, uh, you know confirm what letter it is and then write instead of just writing without thinking so you know teaching them those kind of self monitoring skills really help because in the long run you want them to become independent the educator cannot always be there to keep on correcting them work on applying academic skills in meaningful uh, uh, settings preferably real life situations because again if you teach academic skills on paper pencil or in a classroom setting it need not readily uh, you know go into application mode many of these children do have difficulties applying what they've learned on paper pencil activities into real life situations so you know try and use them in real life situations probably you can take the parents help here you know tell them how they can use real home uh, domestic chores that they do or regular home activities that they do and incorporate the academics into those activities you can also have little you know uh, simulated real life situations in the classroom for example if you are teaching money or addition and you can teach you can take it a step further by doing addition with money and you can have a little a small shop set up in the corner of your classroom where the children can go, you know pretend that they are going and buying it so you know have uh, as much as possible real life applications incorporated into your instructional goals in, and your activities provide feedback to the child on a regular basis many of our children uh, with sld have uh, you know again as i said they have very low self esteem they are constantly not sure so they need reassurance most of the time or they are not uh, they are low risk takers you know they're too scared to be making mistakes and getting a negative feedback because they've uh, got this net negative feedback so many times so they would like to avoid those uh, unpleasant situations so it is important that you provide wise feedback to the child 
if they are um, if they are having difficulties you know reassure them give them you know a cues on what coping strategies can help them to go around those difficulties if they are doing well and they are doing the things correctly then you know praise them or give them points charts use behavior management techniques etc so you can provide uh, providing feedback is very very important because it really builds up the confidence level and uh, gives them a reassurance uh, gives children a reassurance that they are on the right track and then last but not the least uh, provide opportunities for independent practice so uh, teaching them one uh, thing with a lot of special educators and regular educators we see is once we know that the child has difficulties we tend to over protect them or give them over support uh, a lot of support may be needed while you are introducing a skill but as the child gets more and more comfortable and you know you reteach several times and the child is gaining control you need to provide enough and more opportunities for the child to practice those skills independently so you need to wean off your support in a graduated manner so that the child becomes more and more independent and is able to function uh, with as minimal uh, as supervision as possible so these are all the things that you need to take into account while planning instruction and when we plan instruction it's good to you uh, plan instruction using vakt or uh, the visual auditory kinesthetic and tactile approach so this is a multi sensory approach and what it does is it helps in presenting learning material in multiple ways the greater part of the learning may take place in the stronger modality of the child so for example if you are giving uh, the same concept in all the different ways probably the visual learner will learn it more from the visual uh, activities that you are uh, giving but at the same time the, when the other activities are done they are uh, they are able to make some sense even through the not so strong modalities as well so when you use multiple multi sensory learning the vakt approach the stronger modality definitely is used you know as a primary uh, learning uh, modality but the not uh, the other mod uh, learning modalities the not so strong learning modalities also start improving because you are they are getting practice even in those provides more opportunities for repetition so when you are giving the same skills but you are giving it in different ways what happens is they are it is getting repeated so many different times and then uh, uh, what really happens is it's not just getting repeated it is also getting repeated in different ways so it provides and helps maintain the novelty and the variety of the activities you are providing so all these help retain the interest and motivation levels of the children so they're getting the repetition but they're not getting it in the same boring monotonous way and uh, uh, using the vakt approach provides for better learning and better retention and better recall so therefore using a vakt approach really provides for more efficient learning so when we look at visual what happens is when you uh, when we look at the visual modalities these children learn better by seeing or visualizing so use things like posters charts videos reading etc auditory if the the auditory learners learn better by hearing and speaking so use read aloud uh, oral discussions music and rhymes and similar kind of audio uh, read, uh, audio text etc in kinesthetic and tactile they learn more through movement and through touch so use you know hands on activities more interactive activities games movement uh, dance etc role play so all these things really help uh, different kinds of uh, learners to uh, learn through different modalities coming to the uh, instructional focus you know what should the instructional focus be in different kinds of settings so most of the children in in different kinds of settings they are um, either in a regular classroom or an inclusive classroom sometimes within a regular school they have resource rooms or sometimes they are in special schools with a self contained classrooms and we also have the clinical setting or the therapy center where they come for services so if it's a regular classroom 
uh, the regular curriculum is in focus. So that is your instruction focus. And you should be, uh, uh, you know, while planning instruction, think of uh, introducing the regular uh, curriculum goals, the curriculum content in different ways and multiple ways so that the child is able to access the curriculum, learn them, retain them and recall them when necessary. When it comes to an inclusive classroom, you still have the regular curriculum content but you also include a component called basic skills remedial training. So if there are certain basic skills which are lacking or the child is having difficulties with, that will also be included uh, as part of the instructional program. Uh, so uh, then you also have a regular school where you have pull out uh, sessions in a resource room. So here again, uh, when you do pull out sessions, obviously you cannot take the entire regular curriculum content. What you can do is take an adapted uh, regular school, take the adapted curriculum. That is you uh, focus on some of the core skills that are necessary and then work on those and then uh, add on the basic uh, remedial skills also, the basic uh, reading, writing and math skills, whatever the child needs help with. When it is a self-contained classroom in a special school, uh, or it's a completely self-contained classroom, here the curriculum is fully adapted. Uh, usually fully adapted, you can you know, modify the content as per the child's needs. And you also include a strong functional life skills component into, uh, into this. So many of the children, even if they are not really doing higher level maths, uh, maybe you will still teach them something about you know, money management or time management and so on. Uh, this is an example of how functional, uh, you know, functional math is introduced. This is just an example. So similarly, in other areas also, you may introduce functional life skills with an adapted curriculum. And then when you come to the clinical settings, in the clinical settings, usually uh, when children come there, they're already attending one of the uh, previously mentioned four settings. So they're already getting those services. But in addition to that, they're coming to the uh, clinical uh, setting for uh, you know extra support. So here you have to look at what does the child actually need that the child is not getting in the other places, the other settings. Also, what are the uh, what do the parents what are the parents looking for? So you, know, so you have to strike a harmonious balance between the two, and then that will define what exactly you're going to focus on while uh, planning instruction. So it could be if they're coming, if they're go uh, going to appear for a board exam, it could be modifying or, you know, uh, simplifying the curriculum content for the bo um, uh, board exam and giving that in a uh, clinical setting. Sometimes it will be working on the basic uh, remediation skills, uh, especially when younger children come to us, you know, we normally, uh, we tell the parents don't look at the curriculum content for now. Because right now they need to be able to learn how to read, how to comprehend, how to uh, express their ideas and thoughts in writing. Because if they don't have those foundational skills, they will not be able to access the curriculum at any level. So then, in the you know, in those cases, we uh, counsel the parents that you know that is what is necessary. So we will try and work on those things, which will definitely have a positive impact in learning the curriculum content in whichever uh, setting they are going to. So in the clinical setting, it is more individualized, it is more tailor-made to suit the student. Um, and it is very, very narrowed down to focus on what exactly the child needs. So it is, and uh, what, uh, especially at that, at the stage of time that they're coming uh, to the clinical for remediation. And in the clinic, the other good thing is you may have a transdisciplinary input as well. You may have the speech therapist or OT, you know, all these people would be available usually in these kind of centers where their input and their sessions can also be, uh, give an added uh, service uh, to the child. So that brings us uh, to an end of how to, what are the broad umbrella of how to plan instruction, what are the things that we need to take care of while planning instruction, and how these things, uh, you know, change slightly when we uh, talk about in instructional uh, instruction in different kinds of uh, settings that the student is placed. In. So I think uh, we've come to an end of this webinar. Uh, and uh, we can open it up for Q&A session. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much, uh, Geeta ji. Uh, that was a wonderful session. 
and i hope uh, and i'm definitely sure in fact that a lot of people would have learned wonderful things from you today and we'll learn more in the upcoming q and a session but before moving to the uh, q and a session i would like uh, our participants to know that this webinar series would be followed uh, by another series of workshops for sld and i'm going to launch a poll on your screen shortly uh, if you could let us know what topic would interest you more it would help us plan the content better so the polls are now visible on your screen please uh, cast your votes and let us know what are the topics on which you would like to attend a workshop on and you can choose one or more than one so if you would like to attend workshops on more than one topics feel free to vote for more than one as well so we will wait for another 10 seconds uh while the poll is going on and uh for all the other attendees i would like to inform if you have a child with uh, asd or autism or if you know a child with asd you could definitely check the link in the chat box which will be shortly shared by our team members there is an ongoing workshop series going on for autism which could help these kids better so if you might want to register please do register and if you know uh, parents or special educators who are seeking help for children with autism you can share the link with them as well yeah i could read in the chat box it's a wonderful workshop thank you so much uh, uh, compliments like these keep us going and uh, we are trying to like uh, i already said in the mission we are trying to make things easier for you and all these webinars and workshops are a part of that effort it's nice to so uh, wait. see some of the comments yeah thank you ability i think uh, ability is really doing a wonderful job and you know it feels good to get uh, such good, great participants as well yeah of course okay so looks like uh, most of the people have uh, voted so i'm going to end the poll now and uh, before moving further uh, i would like to inform all the attendees that uh, the way you have been accessing ability resources has now changed and we are really really happy and excited to inform you about this this was how your old and previous resource library used to look but now we have added some more new and exciting features such as filters and uh, resources of different types and this is how the new library looks like but unfortunately because of this transformation you might have to re-register for your ability account and to be able to access these resources one of the ways you can do it is like we usually do we do send emails at the end of the webinar after the webinar is over with uh, links to the resources for the webinar you can use that link to register and create your ability account or you can directly go to this page using our website www.ability.com/resource or you can also access this at the url app.ability.com/resource so you can use all these three ways to reach to this page which has a list of all the useful resources for you to be able to access any of these resources you will need to log in using this screen make sure your login screen looks like this to be able to access the right account and if you don't already have your login credentials you can click on the register here button like you can see just below the login button and uh, it will take you to this screen if you are a professional click on professional if you are a parent or a guardian click on the parent or guardian field fill uh, a few of the fields that are required and just that that your ability account will be created and you will then be able to easily access many many resources not just from this webinar but all the previous webinars and many recommended resources from the different panel of experts that ability has which can help you to help your child better so 
yeah that is one of the things that i wanted to share with you and now without uh, further ado i am pretty sure people are uh, eager to hear answers from you geeta ji so one of the first questions that we have received in the past sessions also and we continue to receive during uh, this uh, for this webinar as well is from savita and many others uh, savita wanted to understand about sensory integration in specific learning disorders and how does it help Uh, in today's webinar i did talk about the learning process so everything starts with sensation and then how the sensory stimuli is processed so when okay. there, there are uh, snags in certain processing for example many of the children with slb do have difficulties with visual processing or auditory or both and which is why it manifests as academic difficulties so when uh, you know it is kind of when if you think of an electrical connection You know, sometimes you have a loose connection going on or a cross connection going on. It's not there all the time, but it's there. It is kind of there. Those are glitches which are always giving you trouble. So then you have to plug into those, and you have to correct that. Uh, you know those glitches and snags, so that, that learning process takes place. The processing takes place much more smoothly. So sensory integration. That is what it does. Uh, You know, from for the different sensations and the, for the learning process to happen smoothly, there needs to be a harmonious balance in the system, in the body system. And when we do sensory integration, that's what it does. It tries to restore that balance. So, and it can be done through lots of activities. You know, even things like yoga, meditation, games, which you you know a lot of sensory kind of games. All these help. so uh, especially anything which involves both sides of the body because when you use both sides of the body both parts of the brain is stimulated and right. uh, when different kinds of sensory stimulation is given uh, the child experiences those and learns to process those so uh, when you give sensory integration basically the basic principle is it tries to provide a sensory balance into the system so whatever ups and downs are there it brings about a better equilibrium so all this ultimately does help reading it's not that it just directly helps academic uh, skills or anything but all this help finally contributes to a more harmonious learning process sure interesting hope that answers your questions avidha and so many others that have who had asked it about a sensory integration moving on the next one is from shimi lao i hope i'm pronouncing your name correctly uh, shimi is asking us if children with specific learning disorders should be placed in the mainstream classroom or should they be given instructions in pull out classes so this question keeps coming back again yes, and again yes yes it's a very very common question Yeah, uh, as far as possible, they should be in the mainstream with the support systems. Uh, but having said that, every child is different. Every child's um, uh, needs also differ as the curriculum advances or as the child uh, keeps going up the uh, grade levels. So it has to be. It is not a one-time solution. You know, uh, just because the child has been mainstreamed in the early classes doesn't mean the uh in the later classes also also that will be beneficial so it has to be reviewed from time to time uh, as much as possible the child should be in the mainstream setting in inclusive settings because uh that's uh, you know the child can be with the peers learn with and from the from the peers and uh, it is not just academics it's also the social development the self esteem you know all these emotional development for all this being in the mainstream does really help but having said that again as i said sometimes when the curriculum levels get harder uh, the children find it more uh, you know when they find it's very demanding the regular classroom environment or the support systems that uh, they are receiving is not enough to cope with the challenges that they have then definitely you might have to think of other kinds of settings where there are pull out sessions sometimes it's a mix of both you know sometimes they can attend uh, regular ed settings but for certain lessons or for certain times they can be uh, getting pull out sessions so it is uh, you have to take into account the needs and challenges of each child their strengths uh, uh, see what support systems that they are getting in their school settings 
uh, sometimes even changing a school helps you know even from right. one regular school to another regular school if there is a regular school which is much more flexible with regard to children who have special needs that might help so again setting is something that ha- is never constant it is fluid and uh, parents have to realize educators also have to realize that you know it doesn't mean that uh, one setting is for life it might change according to the changing needs according to the progress made by the child according to the curriculum demands and expectations etc sure uh well what an interesting answer to the question so constant review is uh, required and uh, the needs keep changing that is uh, like the golden statement to remember moving on to the next question uh geeta ji you did talk about the vakt method uh, madhura who is a special educator is uh, asking us even though she is using vakt method sometimes the child is unable to memorize because of lack of interest of the child so what uh, can be done uh, in this case um you know when we plan these activities again you know a lot of times children lose interest if we are making it uh, look like more like a learning activity so, you know uh, when we say vakt as i said earlier also in this webinar itself make it high interest activities you know try and see what are the child's interest uh, talk to the parents or talk to the um, even the regular teachers or their friends you know see what the child is good at see what really motivates the child try and try and use those modality uh, those avenues as well so just uh, vakt what we plan may not be suitable or may not be appealing to the child so it is very important to see that uh, what motivates the child uh, that we have to incorporate it into the vakt approach and uh, when we do that you know definitely we will uh, we'll be able to engage the uh, student more actively if there is no active student engagement uh, yes interest will go down motivation will be down uh, efficient learning will not happen and also make the uh, learning activities more meaningful and meaningful means um, you know the uh, if if you look at even us when we learned in high school if you ask me about the high school physics or calculus that i learned in high school i never saw any meaning then i didn't i don't see any meaning now you know thinking what why did i, I learn calculus because i just didn't find any relevance of that in my life neither right. then nor now so then i have you know you tend to forget those things so it is important to make everything meaningful and see how it will impact them in their daily life so try and connect that's why i said when i uh, while planning instruction make it application oriented you know right. use it in meaningful as much as possible real life activities so they see the connect between the academics you are teaching and how it is going to be used in their everyday life right agree make it meaningful and uh, hopefully then the students would find it meaningful too and show some more interest there okay the next question is from pawandeep kaur Pavandeep uh, believes that uh, children with SLD uh, tend to sh- uh, deal with a lot of procrastination. So, how to help these children who tend to procrastinate a lot? If you could answer that for Pavandeep. Hello. Okay. so uh looks like uh, geeta ji is facing some technical uh, challenges and uh, network issues but she will be back uh, shortly meanwhile uh, i would like to inform you all okay she's back uh, geeta ji were you able to hear our question no i just had a net issue yeah yeah no worries so i would repeat the question it is from pawandeep kaur uh, pawandeep uh, believes that uh, children with specific learning disorders tend to procrastinate a lot so is it true and if it is then how to deal with procrastination in specific uh, learning disorder students procrastination is a problem with a lot of people not just children with uh, specific learning disorders so um, uh, i think uh, you know think about what you will what you do if you know you want you have some deadline to meet and we are not doing it 
Now we uh, set up a schedule or we use uh, certain motivators or if it's a task which we don't like doing, break it up into smaller units. So you do it bit by bit, you know, sure. uh, or, uh, you know, give yourself some reward. OK, if it's a one hour activity, I'll do it for 10 minutes and then maybe I'll take a five minute music break or, you know, uh, uh, go for a walk or something. No, so think of those kind of strategies. Uh, what do we use? Use similar kind of things for the children as well. Uh, so uh, procrastination is there in a lot of children. That's mainly because uh, they're too scared to undertake that academic task, which is, appears very daunting to them. So simplifying it, making it more interesting, making using, uh, using more attractive and appropriate learning materials, or introducing the topic in a way that you know catches the student's attention. So instead of straight away starting with paper pencil work, maybe you can do things like, you know, show a video or show a movie, and then start your academic uh, skills. You know, based on that. And for example, I've done things like when uh, we had to do comprehension. Uh, you know, instead of doing it from a passage in a book, we would watch a short a movie. You know, a short film of ten or fifteen minutes and then from that questions would be given so they had to answer comprehension questions based on that so again you know do it in different ways so that uh, you know the children uh, will not have trouble getting started and then again you know use reinforcements use things like rewards and uh, things like these which is um, you know uh, which will motivate the child to come up okay these are all external motivators but you know you have to try and build an internal motivator so internal motivators is also you know using uh, things like uh, once they've done something uh, you know uh, uh, ask them to verbalize it like yes i did it you know you know self congratulating themselves or giving themselves a pat on their backs so these kind of strategies actually help them to feel good about themselves when they when they've right. done something so uh, it doesn't have to be always the other person giving the motivation or, you know, giving the reinforcements or the rewards. Teach them to uh, self-motivate uh, themselves as well. And uh, as I said, you know, variety of activities. So all these... Yeah. Looks like uh, there's network trouble again. But if you have attended the session by far and you would like to give us uh, some feedback so that we can improve further, uh, feel free to share your feedback in the feedback link below. Yeah, Gitaji, you are continuing. Sorry. Yeah, yeah I just uh, I thought there was a glitch in the net because it yeah, froze yeah, yeah. suddenly. And yeah. So uh, was I audible for the throughout the answer? No, no. Uh, for the past uh, 30 seconds, you were not. So if you could repeat that. Yeah. yeah uh, what I was saying was, you know, it's OK for educators. It should start off as, you know, external motivators and external reinforcements and rewards by parents, teachers. But, uh, you know, slowly we should move into uh, self-motivation and self-rewards and, you know, how they uh, give themselves a pat on the back, self-congratulate it themselves at having done something really good, making them feel proud about themselves if they've achieved something, even if it is small achievements. So those uh, kind of help you to wean off these external or extrinsic motivators and reinforcements and move more towards intrinsic motivators, because that's what will remain with them throughout life. All through their life, there, is, there isn't going to be somebody giving them external reinforcement and motivation. Ultimately, they have to move towards intrinsic or internal motivation and reinforcements. So try and build those also. These are all part of, you know, uh, making them grow better emotionally and socially. So all this comes under behavior management and, uh, you know, how to make them realize their self-worth and make them, uh, you know, uh, raise their self-esteem about themselves and make them more confident individuals. Sure, definitely. Interesting. Moving on, since uh, we have less of time and a lot of questions, so I would quickly focus on the questions. The next one is from Hema Sahu. Uh, you did 
talk about VAKT in detail. What Hema is asking us is what are some of the ways or tests to identify what kind of learner is the child? If he is a visual learner, auditory, kinesthetic or tactile learner, if there are methods or strategies to identify that. Uh, normally, when we are doing these assessments, it kind of gives us an idea because you're not just going to do paper pencil assessments. You know, we also do things like, you know, showing them pictures and uh, and a lot of case history information that we take from parents. From that also, you know, parents give a lot of information. If you, um, a lot of times we also get in touch with the school teachers or ask them, ask the parents, you know, uh, what is the feedback the teachers are giving you? So a lot of this information put together gives us an idea what kind of, you know, how the child might be learning, uh, uh, what might be the stronger modality of learning. And even through the assessments that we're doing, we don't stick to one kind of assessment. We actually give a variety of things and then you can see how the child is responding in these situations. So that gives you an idea. But once you start the lessons, when you give a VAKT, what the good thing is you're giving it to them in all the modalities. And you can definitely see which one the child is catching on more. So, uh, you know, that gives you an idea that you can plan more in the visual area if the child is a visual learner. Uh, but don't ignore the other areas because we want a healthy balance of all the senses, the sensory processing. Right? Definitely. Yeah. Healthy balance is the key. The next question is uh, from Pavandeep again. Pavandeep is saying that ADHD and SLD have uh, comorbidity commonly. So how to handle kids with both ADHD and SLD if you have any specific set of advices? Uh, basically, it is uh, more with uh, children with SLD um, have academic issues and, and uh, ADHD is very commonly seen in children with SLD. Uh, that's, uh, but we actually have to see whether it is really a diagnostic disorder of uh, ADHD or is it just because of the academic difficulties. If you plan instruction in such a way that it motivates the learner, you, uh, the child, you know, is not sitting at a table and uh, chair for long hours because children with ADHD have difficulty doing that. So if you, if, you, if you plan activities for shorter duration, give them breaks in between, you know, uh, they get bored also very easily. So don't give the same activities all the time. Bring in novelty and variety into your activities. All the things that I said for planning instruction, that holds good for uh, children with ADHD also. Uh, having said that, some of them might require in some extreme cases, some of them, despite all this, they might find it difficult to focus. And in that case, you may have to consult a medical professional, a doctor, to, if they, to see if they need medication. So for some children, along with all the behavior management and instructional planning and all that, uh, they might also require uh, medicines to help control their ADHD. Sure. Sure. Since we're running short of time, I would be taking two last questions for the day. Uh, if you have further more questions, please feel free to join the upcoming webinars in the series. And I hope uh, your questions will be addressed uh, in the upcoming webinars, if not today. So the next one is from Anita Alawat. Anita is saying if you could give some tips and tricks for planning uh, IEP for children with specific learning disorders. I would like to like uh, mention this to the fellow audience members. IEP stands for Individualized Education Plan. Correct me, Gita Ji, if I'm not wrong. So sharing some tips to plan IEP and also if you could uh, differentiate between accommodation, modification and adaptation, the terms that you used uh, today in your pro presentation. Yeah, uh, with IEP, IEP is Individualized Educational Program. And program. IEP usually has, follows a certain format. Uh, so if you look online, you'll find several formats. Every school, uh, for example, if there are schools which have departments of special ed or resource teachers, they might have slightly, more or less they're the same, but they might have slightly different formats in each school. So, uh, so it is a, a program planned for that particular child. Uh, with certain annual goals and short-term objectives and what they're going to cover in those uh, in that uh, time duration and so on. So usually annual goals are planned and then they're broken into uh, term-wise or three-month uh, 
trimester kind of uh, short term objectives and uh, instruction is planned accordingly and learning activities are planned accordingly so that's how iep is done and when you are doing iep basically what you are doing is planning the instructional uh, program and all that was covered in today's webinar basically holds good for uh, while while you write the uh, iep also uh, planning instruction is once you've written the iep uh, the lesson plans you know uh, you, uh, then come into play so uh, iep is an overall draft of what is going to be covered for the child and then from there on you have those instructional uh, lesson plans which teachers are very familiar with you know uh, you have your activities and materials and so on so that's how the iep works uh, and iep is reviewed again every year the iep is reviewed and a new iep is usually uh, written if you have done it annually uh if you are doing it uh, every 3 months it depends on school to school some people do it every 3 months or every term some write an iep for the whole year and then it's reviewed at the end of the year so whichever duration you planned for according to that you'll have to review it and write new iep's uh, once the duration is over uh coming to accommodation modifications and uh, adaptations uh, very interchangeably used terms uh adaptation basically we know what the term means right to be able to adapt or to adjust to uh to the environment so uh here when we talk about sld kids we are talking about how the child uh, what adaptations we can make to enable the child to access the curriculum or to learn better so uh basically adaptations is the same as modification adaptation is not necessarily a very technical term used in special education we normally use the term accommodations and modifications and modification right. is similar to adaptations modification is when actually you're making uh, changes in what the student is going to learn that is the curriculum content you're making changes to the curriculum content so that the child can access the curriculum better that is modification and uh, it's similar to what adaptation is accommodation is you're not actually ch uh, changing the content but you're changing how the child is going to learn that so it may be the right. same uh, content which the other children are learning in the classroom but you're going to change the strategy or the activities for this particular child so say you're reading a story in the classroom you're working on this uh, the lesson on plants so everybody is using what the textbook is saying or the activities that is planned there but for this child maybe you'll have to use the same textbook but you're going to change that content and give it in more uh, accessible format so probably you might use audio visuals or get the child to make plant uh, actually go and plant seeds and grow plants you know so uh, how the learning happens that is change and that's called accommodation what the child is going to learn if you make changes there that's called modification and adaptation is uh, again i said not a very technical term it's the same as modification interesting i definitely learned something new today it's Thank very so interchangeably much. used though you know it's uh, and uh, it's very hard to say okay is this an accommodation is this a modification there is a big overlap here as well so it's generally used together like accommodations and modifications modifications of course but it was interesting to learn the sight yes. line of yes, difference yes, yes. between uh -huh. the two Okay, well, coming to the last question for today's session. This is an interesting one uh, from uh, Sanjeevni Yashodhara. So Sanjeevni is asking us if we can use abacus for children with specific learning disorders, and if using abacus would help them in any significant way. Uh, see, there's no right or wrong approach or right or wrong uh, material when it comes to any children, and certainly not with children with SLD also. if you find that works with the child go ahead use it abacus is a very hands on instrument to uh, material to use so you know children will actually enjoy using it but for some children it may not work so why we have to really look and see what works with whom and uh, in sld one thing i always tell all the staff or parents or anybody at all and something i believe in myself is there's never a right or wrong approach A, a right or wrong approach happens only if you're not teaching with a long vision in mind uh, what works and what will work in the long run 
you know it shouldn't be that something works for now but later on when that concept gets harder the child gets stuck that shouldn't happen okay right. but otherwise use whatever works with the child whatever the child is comfortable with whatever the child um, is able to uh, is enabling the child to access the curriculum better and progress better right interesting so whatever works for the child is the right choice there's no right or wrong in case of child or for uh, any child for that matter not only for children with specific learning disorders thank you so much geeta ji that was a very interesting message and very valuable piece of advices and information shared by you like always with all the attendees here thank you so much for joining us today uh, to dear fellow participants and attendees i would like to inform and remind you once again if uh, you want to attend a workshop the ongoing workshop series on autism you can find the link in the chat box and you can register for the series if you have not registered for the entire series of sld you can also find the link to register for the upcoming webinars in the ongoing specific learning disorder series and register for the upcoming webinars apart from that do not forget to share your feedback with us all and also subscribe our youtube channel and <laughs> follow our facebook page to stay posted about all the updates from ability thank you so much for joining us thank you geeta ji how did you like today's session it was wonderful and i loved the questions so a lot of very relevant very pertinent questions asked so that is something i really like from the ability community participants so yeah kudos again to the participants for asking very very relevant questions thank you definitely definitely we have got a bunch of very enthusiastic learners i would say who definitely enjoy learning from experts like you and i hope that this process continues definitely thank you everyone happy for joining us today <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Have a nice evening all. You too. Thank you.